Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for, so much for joining us today. My name is Gina Turnage, and I am part of the Hypothesis team. It's really great to see so many attendees here, and we appreciate you guys taking some time out to spend with us. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters from the University of Toronto. So please welcome uh, Paola uh, Barges and Emma McDonald, who will be leading today's this session titled Reading is Writing, Social Annotation as Agentic Reading Practice. And I'm gonna let the presenters take it from here, but I will be on, uh, on the call though, on the, work, on the session. If there's any questions or anything comes up, uh, I'll be available as well. All right, take it away. Thank you, Gina. We are delighted to be here and uh, really looking forward to sharing our experience and hearing from the audience your comments and questions. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so of all the articulations of the metaphor of the reader as B, perhaps um, Erasmus is the most uh, beautiful and layered and interesting. But uh, this is not the first articulation nor the oldest of the idea that an, uh, the interface between reading and note taking has uh, uh, the potential to um, not only aid in learning, but actually is essential to the constitution of the learning subject or the ethical subject. So uh, already in the first uh, century of the Christian era, Seneca had articulated already these, or through the same metaphor of the reader as V, had articulated the idea that the uh, interweaving of uh, reading and note taking was essential to the formation of an ethical subject. Uh, and so it's not just an articulation of a methodology or a practice, but also an articulation of a, a promise of reading as being a method of self edification. Um, uh, Michel Foucault takes over um, as part of his investigation of the practices of the self or the technologies of the self. He studied uh, through antiquity, passing through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, all the practices of notebook keeping or in our language, commonplace book keeping as, as a practice that integrates reading and note taking. And that is again uh, a practice through which uh, you know the self uh, constitutes itself. A practice through which uh, we can shape ourselves in the direction, in the ethical and aesthetic direction that the subject desires. And so there's a long, kind of like rich trajectory of what could be considered a simple idea that is just simply keeping a notebook. There's a very rich tradition in the in philosophy and rhetoric of utilizing this particular tool as a, as a manner of uh, shaping oneself or yeah, shaping oneself through uh, these methods and these particular habits. Okay, so this obviously this, um, this quotation, in a way, is the uh, inaugural inspiration for the design of this course that is called Assembling Relations Between Self and Text, the Digital Commonplace Book. And so the idea in this course is not only to um, uh, kind of like investigate uh, practices of reading now in this moment in which the emergence and uh, increased prevalence of digital reading practices are introducing challenges and affordances that we are in the process of investigating as they emerge. And, uh, and so the idea is, is at least like, is, is kind of thinking about how is it that that accumulated knowledge uh, of reading practices can be applied or be brought alive as we are occupying this threshold between print reading and digital reading. Um, so there's that that kind of like question, but also the idea that we are practicing this course, reading not just as a kind of like a method for learning some content, but as a, as a as a kind of habit that we continue to uh, perform and practice as students become agents of their own education, and uh, and have more kind of like control over how is it that they approach how they read and uh, what they read and how is it that they advance through their through their courses so so uh, all those things are kind of like being interlaced in the in the courses methodology 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the entangled uh, registers of reading. Sorry, I am looking for some notes that were important before. I want to say to that because this is a third year uh, seminar in digital humanities. We are also applying pedagogical principles that um, are very pertinent to learning in the digital humanities. And some of these principles have to do with uh, ex uh, or um, emphasizing experiential learning, emphasizing inquiry-based learning methodologies in which students, again, the priority is not so much on the content, but on the kind of like practices and habits and the manipulation of tools that students learn throughout these courses. And so students learn, learn by doing. Um, actively applying the questions, uh, the methods of the discipline, but also engaging in critical reflection regarding the digital tools that they learn, uh, that they used to learn. And so obviously part of uh, the content of the course is an ongoing reflection on the use of hypotheses and the other tool that we use that is a platform called Obsidian and how is it that these platforms can be used as devices for learning and also for exploring uh, the the questions that emerge on this threshold between print uh, reading and digital reading. Uh, so that concerns more kind of like the digital aspect of the pedagogy. In particular, in this course, then we are uh, concerned with three, let's say, three dimensions that are intertwined in the in throughout the course of the of the learning experience. One is the notion or the as I explained, kind of like the threshold between uh, reading on print and reading on screen. And that is what we call from page to screen. And is the notion that we're going to investigate reading as a historically and technologically mediated practice and to explore interdisciplinary reflections on the practice of reading and note taking at the juncture between printed page and digital screen. One of the uh, biggest kind of like learning outcomes in this course has to do with understanding the distinction between the medium of reading, it could be a book or a printed page and or the digital screen and the uh, forms of let's say close and hyper reading that we can implement in approaching these texts. And so in a way, one of the big uh, learning outcomes is to understand that the medium in which the text is published does not necessarily determine the modalities of reading that you can apply to the text. And so in a way, students move through various uh, reading uh, forms of engaging texts and they can again, exert more autonomy and develop their agency in terms of how these techniques are going to be applied to the various texts that they engage, whether they are in print or in digital mediums. Uh, the second entangled register of learning is the notion that reading is writing. And so it is uh, throughout the course, there's a very robust practice of integrating reading and writing uh, through various uh, modalities that include um uh, close reading and hyper reading strategies hypothesis is of uh, very good use to us to produce or to encourage uh, text anchored annotations that move us away from kind of like generalized readings of the text it, it kind of like compels the students to locate themselves in particular segments and fragments of, of the text not only to kind of like dig deeper into potential meanings but also to use that as a potential opportunity the annotation to develop their own deeper uh, interests that may emerge from one simple quotation in one of these texts so in that sense it's a very good example of how hypothesis can be used both to foment uh, close reading strategies, but simultaneously to produce hyper reading strategies that move students away from the uh, text that we're reading and into further investigation. So that's very coherent with uh, notions of hyper reading that, that allow students to uh, kind of like supplement their reading with additional investigation. Uh, obviously, because the students are creating a commonplace book and I'm, I'm going to explain a bit Later how that looks like, students are also implementing strategies of text selection, indexing, categorization, and curation of materials, much of which are, are quotations and their own 
um, associative um, annotations in assembling these commonplace book, which is, uh, as a short definition, is an annotated personal anthology that documents a trajectory of the student's intellectual becoming. This commonplace book is the main assignment in this course and is a scaffolded assignment that students develop through various distillations of the materials that they've been accumulated throughout the course. Uh, the last um, entangled register of reading is the notion that I kind of like already explained that brings us back to Erasmus quotation and is the fact that reading is a practice of the self. And so here we follow Erasmus and Seneca's uh, reflections on reading and uh, reading uh, together with um, annotation as a, a autopoetic practice that is not just about learning some content, but about shaping the very being that is learning. Uh, Seneca has a very uh, potent uh, metaphor for this process and is the idea that through this process of reading and note taking, we bring, we, uh, we transmutate the words of others into our own blood and flesh. So it becomes kind of like the material that we are actually made of. And this is actually an idea that is uh, part of the uh, very important part of the process of uh, constructing the commonplace book. Okay, so again, uh, so the commonplace book is simply, in a way, a notebook uh, in which um, students are going to annotate and curate a, collect a collection of quotations and passages transcribed from miscellaneous text that document a trajectory of the reader's intellectual becoming. Very important to this notion is the idea that students are going to eventually come up with their own articulation of the question and the theme that they want to explore more deeply in the course. So in a way, it, it goes it brings us back to that notion of the bees gathering nectar from various flowers to at the end produced a uniquely flavored honey that is the uh, particular amalgamation that the students are going to make with the shared materials that they've been reading and annotating and exerting and, and quoting. Uh, very important to, uh, to the uh, creation or the assemblage of the commonplace book is our use of the Settelkasten workflow, which was developed by the German sociologist, uh, Niklas Luhmann. And he provides us with a particular methodology that allows us to construct a scaffolded commonplace book in which we are progressively distilling from those very, uh, let's say the initial notes that we all take in hypothesis or that the students take in hypothesis to being able to produce a particular um, um, uh, commonplace book based on their own interest related obviously to the theme of the course, which is reading. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, okay, so before explaining a bit of how, you know, like everybody obviously here is familiar with hypothesis, but I want to talk a bit about how we use the platform Obsidian uh, for this uh, labor of thinking. Uh, but before that, it's important to, to talk about the commonplace book um, kind of like in, in three ways. One is kind of like the, the thinking space in which the students are selecting, copying, categorizing, and annotating the text. And that particular platform is digital and is the platform of Obsidian. Uh, there's also the method of invention and discovery that relies heavily on these kind of like copying down and transcribing and making connections, dot connecting between the materials that are being assembled and uh, how these transfers, because it's a regular and repetitive activity in, it, it becomes a habit of active, deep and close reading. <laughs> So again, I'm not gonna explain how hypothesis works, uh, but I am going to explain how Obsidian uh, helps us in these, um, uh, in, in, in kind of like, or becomes the platform in which we assemble the commonplace book. And so Obsidian, like hypothesis, is a free non-proprietary um, digital tool. Uh, and it's a knowledge uh, management system 
uh, that again, because it's not proprietary, uh, it doesn't work like Evernote or Notion. It does the, neither the content nor the forms of organization of the material belong to any particular corporation. Everybody who uses Obsidian can, in a way, shape the platform to fit their own knowledge uh, management uh, needs and styles. Uh, Obsidian uses a markdown language, which makes it kind of like a universally transfer is the universal language of computing. So you can uh, manipulate and uh, and deal with these files in, in, in any other, uh, with any other kind of like word processing system. It is future proof precisely because it uses markdown language. And so your notes will forever be able to be read by a computing machine. And But one of the biggest advantages and the reason why I chose this particular platform for this course is that uh, many of the other um, note-taking and uh, knowledge management uh, tools available, uh, out, uh, available uh, emphasize kind of like a system of knowledge organization that is based on folders. And uh, in contrast, Obsidian allows us to use both tagging and the most important innovation of Obsidian, which is uh, links that make it possible to connect nodes and to actually visualize those connections in, in a graph view, which is the image that you can see uh, in the right corner. And so you can uh, connect notes in this kind of like associative way and also um, see them in this graph view. So this is the, the potential to make links that are not um, uh, based on folders is an, an essential aspect of why we're using this particular platform. Uh, before Emma is going to explain why this is so important, I just want to give you kind of like a brief um, understanding of how the workflow uh, moves us through the scaffolded uh, uh, um, uh, assemblage of the common place book. And so we begin with what is called the fleeting notes, which are notes taken uh, simultaneously with reading. These are notes that are typically taken with hypotheses. All the students have access to all the uh, course reading materials on hypotheses, and I often take up those very annotations of the students to kind of like as a springboard for my own uh, class discussions. And so the students are uh, engaging in these uh, close readings and text anchored annotations that build their fleeting notes. When students submit their fleeting notes, they are submitting a kind of like a very experimental collection of quotations and annotations and associative links between these uh, materials that through a robust uh, process of feedback eventually leads them into identifying an individual um, topic of research and, uh, and eventually into writing literature notes and permanent notes. One of the nice things about the, the method is that it distinguishes between, you know, like the temporality of note taking, uh, because there's notes that are, as I said, simultaneous with reading, but there's also uh, a, a, a further manipulation of the materials in, in, in note taking within the Obsidian platform. And so in a way, you're always all the time working and distilling the same materials in a different in in different moments of engaging with the text. Uh, the literature notes are um, uh, the literature notes are kind of like condensed notes of um, um, longer materials. So it could be uh, a particular research paper or a chapter in a book. Uh, and the students uh, in this at this particular moment develop what is called kind of like a strategic summarizations in which they are not just going to summarize the texts, but identify those passages and those segments or excerpts that speak to the particular ways in which they are um, articulating and categorizing their own uh, research question and, and topic. So the ways in which they are thinking about a particular question is the way through which they are going to be uh, approaching these uh, notes of longer texts. 
This is something that is not unfamiliar to any process of kind of like writing a research paper. But here we have a kind of like a very slow and scaffolded process and very actually a process that involves a lot of meta reflection into how it is that you are assembling in very unique ways the materials that you're finding that are relevant to your particular research question. Uh, lastly, uh, the permanent note is written in the form of, a, of, of the genre of the blog. And in this, at this particular moment, students are more concerned with arrangement and, uh, and uh, writing a text that is very um, interesting to an audience. And so here is more, is less about the content and more about the form of the, of the publication. So there's been, okay, Emma is going to showcase some of her work as well, but there's, uh, at this point is about kind of like replicating the voice, the inquiry centered voice of the blog and actually taking advantage of the hyperlinked uh, nature of uh, the blog genre to create texts that are not just linear, but that take advantage of the uh, horizontal expansions that hypertext allows us to do. And so uh, we've talked a lot about uh, kind of like the importance of associative and connective and dot connecting uh, um, work in the course. And so now Emma, I, uh, Emma is going to explain to us a bit of how that matters in, in this course design. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is Emma McDonald. I'm a uh, fifth year uh, bachelor's degree student at U of T. I'm majoring in anthropology and uh, minors in cinema and digital humanities. Um, I took this class. I took this class with Paola um, a year ago, <laughs> I think in the winter of 2023. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, um, thank you so much for uh, for asking me to, to join you today. Um, I'll explain a little bit about uh, the concept of the rhizome um, as it as it applies to the class and what I sort of what I gleaned about the concept out of taking the class. Um, it, very simply, it's you know it's a uh, uh, a system of connections. Um, it's it's seen a lot in nature. There are a lot of examples of uh, rhizomatic connections in root systems, like in ginger and grass, things like this, um, where you know. Uh, it's a system wherein one node can be connected to any other node uh, in a, a vast variety of ways. Uh, it's, it highlights um, uh, intense interconnectivity. Um, the metaphor of the root system, uh, the rhizome, was used by um, uh, Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari in um, their 1980 book, A Thousand Plateaus, to describe um, how human knowledge relates to each other, how it connects, um, you know, as a sort of a replacement for the more linear oriented um, uh, example of the tree of knowledge, this idea that um, knowledge is hierarchical and, um, you know, designed to be passed down in a sort of a linear fashion, you know, you learn this and then you learn this and then you get to learn this, that kind of thing. Um, they countered that with the, uh, with the example of rhizomatic knowledge, wherein uh, it's, it's not linear, it's not goal oriented, it's a process of discovery that is, uh, you know, for uh, for a lack of a better term, random. Um, you are you are constantly experiencing different kinds of connections, and there are uh, what, uh, innumerable uh, opportunities for connection within the systems that uh, that human beings share knowledge in. And that's maybe more true than ever in a context where we're using digital platforms that are reliant on um, the internet. Uh, the internet is inherently rhizomatic. Um, there's a great quote from a, a blogger, Matt Blumink from 2015, where he says um, in his description of, of the internet as being rhizomatic, he says, uh, in the rhizome and uh, in the internet, there is no central structure, but an infinite number of interlocking nodes, many of which are produced from a bottom up grassroots system that allows for each individual to have a voice. Knowledge becomes saturated, but in doing so becomes democratic or even uh, anarchistic in nature. So he's defining, you know, in this sense that uh, the rhizomatic um, 
connections that the internet relies on uh, and that many of the softwares um, that we use on the internet or that we use sort of within the internet um, are revolutionary in their in their possibilities for uh, for knowledge expansion and connections with knowledge and expressions of knowledge. Um, how would you? Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, um, so, as an example of the kind of work that I um, that I did in Paolo's class, um, uh, this is an example of a fleeting note that I made using hypothesis. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the annotations we were encouraged to make um, were um, uh, sort of what question oriented. A lot of it was it was less about. Uh, being able to demonstrate uh, preconceived knowledge, but rather an encouragement of exploration and encouragement of like, um, you know, uh, sort of not demonstrating a lack of knowledge, but demonstrating a curiosity, demonstrating a, you know, a, an interest in, and not just an interest uh, contained within the text, but expansive beyond the text. Um, so this was a, yeah, an example where you know, I came across a word, of course, I was familiar with the word paraphrase, but paraphrasis, well, what is that? Uh, you know, I did the thing I've done many times a day for the majority of my life, I googled it, and um, uh, discovered the act of paraphrasing. Um, and in its, in its direct translation from Greek, defining it as an additional manner of expression, um, uh, as a, yeah, as an amplification and expansion on the original content, um, I found that really compelling. Um, oh, shoot. Oh, we're close to the end of our time. Oh, dear. Oh, my God. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yes. oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> um, I can talk very quickly about some, uh, some of the other work that I did. Yes, yes, please. Um, do you, wanna, you want to uh, present a little bit of this or the time and the Yeah. Yeah, this one? Yes, yeah, this one. Okay. Um, my final project, uh, it's, um, you know, through the process of, com of keeping a commonplace book, of doing uh, fleeting notes, literature notes, you know, having my, having my permanent notes, um, I discovered a relationship between um, the rhizome being um, uh, sort of a, what, uh, as a structure of knowledge uh, is, uh, is also interrogating um, the Sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to rush. Um, uh, it was also interrogating the notion that uh, time uh, and the sort of discrete spaces of time that we uh, that we structure ourselves into in at least I'm, I'm very much uh, focusing on a Western context here. Um, obviously, there's around the world and across time, there have been many different uh, conceptions of, of social time. But um, yeah, the way that we sort of structure ourselves in a Western context into these very linear and discrete periods of life wherein, uh, you know, you have sort of one goal and one function, um, you know, the concept of the rhizome and how we trade knowledge within it uh, isn't compatible with that, you know, it sort of collapses this notion that time is, is linear and is, is to be experienced in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, and so in, in looking into that uh, and through other sort of exercises encouraged in the course, um, uh, I found a particularly, um, what, uh, I found this particularly well articulated through music, um, you know, through the, the practice of music, the practice of musicians creating music, um, it is, you know, uh, inherently, um, uh, it is an inherently what collaborative is process. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Emma, I was oh, trying okay. to find your, this one? Yeah, this is this is the slide. Yeah. Oh, this is the one. Sorry, yeah. I, I apologize. And just to step in, we're going to keep the session going for those who want to stick around so we can let our presenters share the rest of their information. So we'll just keep going. Okay. So sorry, Gina. We no, are no worries. No worries. Uh, we're good. We we went into rhizomatic time clearly and forgot our about our time <laughs> limit. <laughs> I love the passion. Are you kidding? It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're experiencing this session non-linearly. Um, I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, so um, I specifically just, I just, you know, to wrap this up, um, just my, my final uh, project uh, in this class uh, focused primarily on how musicians trade, uh, trade information through the processes of covering uh, each other's music, of sampling. Um, it is, it is a, you know, uh, it is also a kind of, um, 
uh, a rhizomatic sharing of knowledge that has a uh, what has a collapsing effect on time in the sense that you can revisit uh, you can revisit and reproduce music um, from any period really uh, and you know it's in, it's intentionally or it's it's inherently social and um, uh, yeah a kind of a kind of annotation a kind of annotative practice um, that reflects I think a lot of the things that we discuss in class uh, in in the context of this class. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. would it be possible to kind of like uh, give our final thoughts? Yes, go ahead. We're, okay, we're on as long as you need. Maybe we can return then, uh, Emma, to some of uh, the other. You know, like I still want to talk about your findings or to present about what did you learn in the course uh, in terms of like annotation. Uh, just a couple of kind of like uh, final thoughts, of course, uh, is we could say much more about all this, but uh, um, um, one of the, you know, affordances of the course and of digital annotation is the capacity to uh, increase the students' um, agency in moving between many and multiple uh, varieties of engagements with text from text anchor digital annotation to the copying and transcription of uh, fragments to doing more kind of like hyper reading uh, modalities and to, and to discover in a way that again the medium does not determine the kind of reading uh, practices that they engage in uh, and also obviously that reading and writing are absolutely entangled. There's no such a thing as reading first and writing later, or the reading is inferior and writing is where your real voice comes up, but that these are indistinguishable pro processes in a way. One, one thing that is really interesting is the notion that we are trying to counter a uh, digital flatness. Some people feel that if they are reading online and making annotations online, and these are notes upon notes upon notes in files in the computer, that in a way everything feels like it's all the same. And so we are thinking a little bit about how the notion of assembling the commonplace book creates kind of like this depth to annotation and how it creates layers and recursiveness very much in the spirit of what Emma is talking about, you know, repetition rather than moving linearly from step A to step C. And that it becomes in that process of distilling and manipulating the material, it becomes a transformative practice. So in that sense, the commonplace book captures thinking as a material articulation of serial difference. Because once again, you're not just moving through endlessly through new content, but you're spending a lot of time manipulating and arranging and uh, categorizing uh, a particular, uh, yeah, a particular material. Another very big uh, um, uh, learning uh, uptake in the course has to do with the notion that originality is combinatorial. And so we return here to the quotation with which we began this presentation to talk about the fact that that uniquely flavor honey comes from the, you know, the visiting of various flowers that produce various forms of nectar. And so is the notion that the students really experiment coming to an idea of their own and to a particular uh, inquiry through the manipulation of, of the already said. And so it does not come from the inspiration of the moment when you're assigned something and you have to write an original essay. It comes from this uh, practice uh, and work with uh, the words of others. Uh, the, the most important point, I think, and actually this was something that I discover actually in implementing this course is how it moved us away from what Emma was describing about uh, not necessarily coming to a position or leaving those, uh, you know, argumentative positions, but becoming and staying curious and being able to linger on those words without having to rush to a conclusion of some sort. And so it is actually more of a kind of like receptive opening up of your curiosity to see what is it that is occurring as you're engaging a particular concept or an idea and where where could it take you. So it, in a way, it fights the what um, Peter Elbow calls the itch for closure, 
that is essential to the argument to argue to arguing is that I fully understand and I already have a position and I'm already in disagreement with. So we are trying to create that a space of suspending judgment and to instead uh, deepen our uh, deepen our knowledge and our curiosity. Uh, if we still have two minutes, I would love for Emma to present what happened to you with the, you know, like as you were uh, engaging with the song, which is a very good example of that kind of implicated reading. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the exercises that was assigned uh, one day was um, putting into conversation a version of Bob Dylan's uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And um, I think, I can't remember what the specific text was, but um, we were looking at the function of lists and of repetition uh, in the, yeah, in sort of uh, rhetorical reading practices, writing practices. Um, and uh, yeah, while I was very closely following the um, the lyrics the, as, as listed um, and also the live recording, um, I noticed that, and you know, I want to preface this by saying it is almost certainly a, just a genuine mistake. Um, but I noticed that uh, that Dylan in the in the live recording skips um, the seventh line of the second verse, where uh, he says, "I saw a white ladder all covered with water." Um, and, you know, uh, again, probably a mistake, definitely not intentional. I'm almost certain it's not intentional, but it got me thinking about, um, you know, uh, what is the, what I'm, I'm now experiencing this, this, uh, this omission, you know, 70, 50 years later, 70 years later. Um, and, uh, and what, what's the significance of that? You know, what does this line mean? Um, uh, what can I now in this experience connect it to, um, you know, discussing this, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of the omission in this performance of uh, what is interpreted um, largely as an escape route rendered useless. It's the reference to the biblical figure, um, Jacob, a dream he has, um, and yeah, and identifies that it's an escape route that cannot be used. Um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, it was it was a compelling moment, and um, you know, I thought I thought more about the context in which this performance was given, um, you know, and wondered wondered about the people in the concert hall, uh, you know, in in 1968 or no 63, um, you know, uh, what were these people thinking? Did they notice? Um, you know, this was just this was a moment that I that I had in this uh, in this class. Uh, I don't know if Paula, if you want to talk more about uh about how it sort of what fits into the larger project that you're that you're attempting to to facilitate in the in the course well i just you know, i think it's a very interesting example of how you know like uh, of close reading obviously because emma uh, is comparing here then the live performance with the lyrics uh, because the exercise was about understanding the rhetorical effects of repetition uh, uh, it's interesting that, you know, like comparing the two versions, then we're noticing, or Emma is noticing the line that is missing, and that that leads her to this investigation and understanding or learning perhaps for the first time about the figure of Jacob's ladder and this notion of an escape route rendered uh, useless. What I love about, also about this entry is that she says, this further research didn't bring me to any conclusions, which is an example of one of those nods that you know may not necessarily be connected to anything else, but that in a way there was enough curiosity and sustained attention to notice this and to wonder, you know, like not necessarily about intentionality, but what is the significance of missing this particular line. So these are the kinds of uh, lovely moments, I would say, uh, in which people can experience knowing with pleasure and with um and with uh, you know curiosity and i should say uh, i don't know am i if this is too much information that you used to work in a record store and so this connects also deeply to your own love for music and uh and so it's a way also of linking kind of like what she already knew with what she is now learning which is uh, such an important aspect of education 
So I don't know, uh, Emma, if you want to say anything else or if we should just uh, leave it here. So Emma, can I ask, this is what I'm thinking, and this is so off topic, but this is what I'm thinking. How did the musicians handle that skip in that line? Because it would mess up their, the, the instrumentation, like they would have been off of where he was. So did they know that he was going to skip the line? And if they didn't know, how did they catch up? Right. I don't, that sounds so off topic, but that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, that's, that's the, the process uh, in which we're sort of engaging of like, uh, and okay, sometimes, sometimes it goes in a different direction. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this particular performance, like a lot of uh, Dylan's early performances, it was just him and a guitar. Um, so there was nobody else, nobody else that he had to consider. Um, oh. And in the context of the, performance like even knowing the song very well you could miss it um I certainly never noticed it um you know it was uh yeah it's really it's a very subtle uh you know very very subtle omission oh well that makes more sense then if it was just an acoustic it was just him now I get it but even though he's probably got muscle memory too of the chords it's all interesting thank you for bringing out something so interesting and unique and I love music not probably to this but I mean I love music so I appreciate this very much is there does anyone uh do you ladies have any closing notes or should we ask if there's any last minute questions questions and comments yeah we have we we've got some great comments really cool talk great session excellent love the conversation oh my gosh warms my heart when we can engage in this kind of um group conversation and, and looking at research and different things. So thanks everybody for posting their comments. Uh...